Laser cutters are among our favorite prototyping and fabrication tools, and we're always curious about advancements that can make safe laser cutting more accessible for the home user. Part of that barrier to entry is the form factor. You typically need a big dedicated space in your shop to house a laser cutter. That's why we were intrigued by the Render Optic, a laser cutter with a unique fold-out design that makes it actually portable. Optic launched on Kickstarter this week, but Jen and I were able to test a late-stage prototype of the system last summer, which is when we recorded the following hands-on video. Render told us they've since made improvements to the laser cutter's design, so you check out their site in Kickstarter for the latest information. Without further ado, here's Jen and I discussing our experiences with the Render Optic last year. Hey everyone, Norm from Tested here alongside... Jen from Tested. And today we're going to be talking about a laser cutter that we've had a chance to be testing out. Uh, that's a kind of a, a late stage prototype. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, this is from a company called uh, Render and it's called The Optic. And they reached out to us because they've been r and and developing this mm -hmm. for a long time now. And the design was something that intrigued both of us as people who have used uh, laser cutters before. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've used kind of like desktop format and then big full-scale laser cutters. And this is a totally new idea where it's a foldable, compact, I mean, this is like smaller than a home office printer. Totally. And the idea is that it's portable. So this is a, a very compact, new, form factor for a laser cutter than what we've seen and what we've used in the past. And over the past couple of weeks, we've been in contact with Render, kind of going back and forth as they're refining their design. So what we have here up front is a prototype that they've shipped us mm -hmm. uh, that should be representative of what they're launching with a crowdfunding campaign. But we wanted to kind of put it through its paces, not only for its capability, but what that user experience is like when you have the potential of a quote unquote portable laser cutter. Right. Um, so I guess let's go unpack this thing, Jen, and show people exactly how it works and why it was so so novel. Yeah. So just so you can get an idea, this is the the form factor of it. It's kind of long and narrow. It's pretty, pretty thin. Um, and it has this folding uh, mat. This is the mat that the actual machine rides on. There's a little tab here to open. It's hard to do this facing the camera. Yeah, it's magnetic. And so here is what you would consider kind of the work area or mm -hmm. the traditional laser cutter, you know, your, your waste board. Yes. Um, so instead of having like a, a honeycomb, you know, bed that we've, we've seen before where the pieces fall through, this is just a mat. And this is also what the laser sort of gantry rides on. Mm -hmm. So the way that this opens up is you actually turn this whole piece and then that drops down just like that. And a wheel pops out. Yep. And the whole gantry moves back and forth on top of your work mat. So essentially, when we think of how these machines work, like this is a two-axis machine. Yes. Right, it moves along this axis, and then there is a laser head that moves along this axis that gives you a work area of, you know, what is this? This is like 12 inches by uh, 18. 18 inches, which is a, a good size, comparable to what you'd find with other yeah. hobby laser cutters. But obviously, it's not enclosed in the same way. Yeah. Uh, and the way they're able to accomplish this design is because they're using a diode laser, right? Which, Which is, is different. A, it's different, yeah. right? I mean, I think when we first got in contact with them, I was like, where's the tube? Where are the mirrors? Yeah. When we're familiar with, you know, the Glowforge or, you know, the full spectrum laser, the Muse, and mm -hmm. the, like those have a CO2 tube that is embedded in the, the design and then using a system of mirrors bounces the laser onto where the head is. Right. So for a diode laser like this, this is similar to like what you would find inside of a Blu-ray player. It's a, it's on the visible light spectrum, so it's a blue laser, and the actual laser head cartridge is pretty small, and that's the whole that's the the power of the machine is all inside of that little thing. So instead of having the tube and the mirrors and all this stuff, you can fit a lot more into this form factor with the diode because it's so small. Right, right. We'll actually show you where that, that head is. Something that they actually, uh, as we were working with them uh, and, and chatting with them about this design, they've been refining it and they added a second diode because yes. it's so small that that, that form factor, um, they can actually in the head here, which I will unlatch and pop out. It's difficult to do this, not <laughs> facing the machine so we can show you. Um, and the other thing to think too is like the lasers that we've used in the past, like uh, generally in the 40 watt range for a desktop laser up to like the Trotec that we use is a 120 watt machine. Um, this comes in around a 20 watt uh, optical output. So it's about half the power of something like a, a Glowforge um, laser cutter, which is 
different variety because that's also a CO2 laser, whereas this is a diode, but you're getting about half the wattage in terms of power output. Right, so this is that laser head. Um, and you know, it's this milled metal piece, it attaches to this axis using this dovetail mm -hmm. joint right here. Um, and it's hard to tell if you can look down here, but there is a lens here. And if you look at the uh, the kind of the form factor here, one is actually a combination of two diodes. One is aiming down, and one is aiming off from the side, and then using a combiner, you know, a one-way mirror, mm -hmm. exactly, uh, for example, it actually combines them, they've calibrated it as such so that it would then focus in the same spot, uh, and you get essentially double the power as you would normally see in one of those uh, diode you know, laser engravers. Right, and the way that you're focusing, so within uh, the track that this laser head sort of sits on, you can adjust the height, the Z height, essentially. Um, it's fixed once the machine is on, but you use this little uh, calibration tool. This is just a little laser cut piece um, with three different heights on it. And this is used to set the Z height of the laser head uh, to get the correct focus for whether you're cutting or whether you're engraving or the thickness of your material. So you can do a couple different operations, but there is a optimal focal length for different operations using this little measuring tool. And what I notice about this is the differences in the height are so minuscule. We're talking about millimeters. Yeah the difference between the focus for a cut versus an engrave, which tells me that it needs to be precise. And not only does it need to be precise, but things like the lens of the laser being potentially occluded by smoke can have a big effect. Definitely. And this, you run into the same issues with the CO2 laser. Um, we did find out that using this, like running this for a short period of time, they recommend that it's cleaned between every three cuts, and that'll depend on what kind of material, like wood, for example, makes a lot more smoke than say plastic does. Um, so that's gonna fog up your laser lens and you need to clean that. So they provided a, a little um, swab and some lens cleaning solution, and you would clean this in between, presumably between every three or so cuts to make sure that you're getting that nice sharp focus and you're getting the right focal length um, and all of that. So that's part of the routine yep. maintenance of yeah. this machine. And that was something that we kind of kind of had to learn that what the standard operating procedures of using a machine like this. Uh, I, I feel like it's definitely designed for people who have the time and patience to do that calibration, do the cleaning. You know, doing a Z height calibration is pretty standard if you're on a commercial machine, right? If you're using a big fiber laser, right. um, those you have to kind of, you have to put your material down and, right. and adjust the Z and, and put input that uh, into the system. Um, if you have something like a Glowforge, they automatically can figure out where the Z is, yeah. do some auto calibration. Um, and the kind of the exhaust system, because this is not enclosed, at least not for the, the bed, it's enclosed just along this right. axis. Uh, that's where we found a lot of the interesting kind of uh, trade-offs with this design. Yeah, so typically, I mean, the, again, the lasers that we've used have a, you know, it's a big bed, there's a, uh, pulling, you know, a fume extractor that's pulling with a pretty powerful fan pulling through, and there's a there's a cover. There's usually a lid which is protecting yeah. you from the UV radiation that's coming from the laser. In this situation, it's just got this little orange uh, sort of visor that goes over where the gantry is, and that is containing most of your fumes. And there's a series of fans inside this. Um, this portion of the machine that are pulling your, your um, fumes out and then pulling them through a filter. So we actually have a couple of these filters you can see. These are, these are prototype ones, so these are the 3D printed versions, um, but there's a, you know, a filter system inside, so it's pulling all of your fumes through that. We did find that the, the fan system that's, that's set up in this current prototype unit that we have is working some of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I took it home to test, it was actually pulling the smoke pretty pretty well through the filter system, but today it wasn't it wasn't doing as well. So we've been using supplemental fume extraction to kind of help dissipate some of that, the smoke that's filling the room. So definitely some room for improvement there, I think, in yeah. terms of extraction, because if you're if you're engraving or you're cutting for any length of time, you don't want all this stuff filling your space. And it's really sometimes with the cutting, because they want to sell this as a machine that can not just engrave. We've seen a lot of multi-axis machines mm -hmm. that you have diode lasers that are engravers, but because they're combining two lasers, they want to really pitch the fact that you can cut through, you know, thicker than just eight inch mm -hmm. plywood for this. But when you're cutting through plywood, or even when you're cutting through acrylic, yeah. you're going to get fumes. Uh, they have designed a system where the fans, you know, there's like airflow that passes through the head mm -hmm. to keep it cool. Um, but you can visibly see the smoke, like yeah. travel along this axis and go through the filter, which they say will 
be something that you'll need to replace maybe every three months with mm -hmm. standard use. Uh, I like that there's a filter built in. We yeah. don't see a lot of lasers with filters built in. No. Uh, but you know, from our use, we could still smell that smoke. Yeah, I think if you were going to be using this in a home environment, you definitely want a space with some ventilation, maybe close to a window, maybe have an additional fan blowing. Um, again, this may be something that gets they continue to yeah. you know to R and D and and figure out some solutions before this Kickstarter is going to go live. But as we're testing it, there's definitely a little bit of a little bit of smoke coming out from the the front of the machine. So yeah, I mean personally, I'm I'm impressed with the engraving quality. These are some of the um, engravings that we've been able to do. Uh, it's worth noting that this uses uh, Lightburn software, which is a uh, laser cutter software that's uh, it's not proprietary to this laser. Lightburn is used for a number of different laser cutters. They have worked with Lightburn to get a specific you know, firmware set up for this mm -hmm. machine. Um, so it talks to the optics specifically. Um, and you can fine tune all of the settings for engrave and cut within there. Um, it, it does give you a lot of functionality in terms of like cross hatching and yeah. the angle and the, the, the actual um, resolution of your cut. So just seeing like this was a super long, super detailed uh, engrave in acrylic. This actually took several hours, I want to say like three hours maybe to get this level of detail, but it is capable of quite a nice, I mean, the, the fidelity and the resolution here is is impressive for an engrave. Um, where I was finding the limitations was starting to be with the cut mm. uh, operation. So I was able to cut out a number of pieces. Um, there's some, some pieces that I cut out here. We've got a couple of these um, things in acrylic, and it was cutting fairly well, but inconsistently. So sometimes it was not, I'd, I'd go through a whole thing, you know, spend an hour doing an engrave, and then you go to cut out the final piece, and it doesn't fully cut through, so you have to start over. <laughs> so, or hopefully don't move the material yes, and, and run pass. an extra pass. Yeah. But if you do an extra pass, then your edges become really just charred and charred, yeah. exactly. Um, and it's also worth noting, like, because this is a diode laser, because you're at a certain, you know, power threshold, um, to cut through material like this, you're looking at minimum four passes. So I was going anywhere between four to six passes to cut through eighth inch plywood, eighth inch acrylic. So you have to start thinking about time. Um, because it's a low, lower power laser, you're in order to get the same level of uh, depth of engrave or the same depth of cut, you have to spend more time. So an operation that might take you 20 minutes is going to be a 40 or a 60 minute operation on a less powerful um, a less powerful wattage. And because lasers are machines that you should always operate, you know, being present in the yes. room, that's also your time as well. You know, kind of babysitting. Babysitting, yeah. exactly. Especially, you know, in the, in the situation where we're smelling still a little bit of smoke or making sure the fans are working or making sure even the, the, the lens is optically clear that we don't have to go through another cleaning pass on it. They did say that they are working on designs where you know you can swap out the filter for a pass through. So mm -hmm. if you have you know uh, your own fume extractor, you can then pipe that through and, and maybe that'll get you better uh, airflow. But the big thing is that you said you took this home to test. Like that's not something we normally right. would be able to do with the Glowforge or with the big Drotech. No, I mean, you could like fold this up, put it in your car, take it put, take it on the train, presumably. Like, because there isn't a big glass tube and fragile optical stuff inside of here, I mean, you don't want to be throwing it around, but it's this is a very portable uh, machine with a really small footprint. So in a space where, you know, real estate is at a premium and you're in your home shop, um, this is a machine that you can pack up and put away when it's not in use, which is like, that's actually a really useful feature. That's what I imagine, like people with you know sewing tables, craft tables, yeah. to be able to tuck a machine like this, which is really just a little bit larger than you know like a plotting device, yeah. right? Uh, that you can tuck that underneath on the side. That's the big advantage, and it seems they've put a lot of thought and consideration on how to make this design work as best as they can, um, but also then comes with these operational quirks that you have to take into right. consideration. Um, yeah, I think overall, I mean, we're excited about this as a, as a form factor and as a new way of looking at, you know, having a piece of laser technology in your home. Uh, it's not going to be a machine that you're doing production work on, clearly, because of the time constraints and the power um, and the, the maintenance schedule. Um, but I think for someone who's who's getting started as a, as a beginner unit, um, this this could be something that you could start off learning about laser cutters, get get your feet wet, um, and not have to commit too much to a giant machine in your space. And a lot of that will have to be balanced with their price, right? Yes. Whether they're pricing it to match 
for that type of user or you know a user who again can spend the time working with filtration, ventilation, yeah. calibration, cleaning, and maintenance mm -hmm. of a machine uh, like this. Uh, if you're interested about the optic, uh, we'll have links to their campaign and more on their website as well. Uh, and I want to thank them, of course, for letting us borrow this early unit. And hopefully, you know, they can improve and iterate. And it seems like they're the fact that they can even change the, the yeah. laser design over the past um, month that we've been working with them uh, shows that they are a fast-moving small company, which you know we want to support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so check it out if you're interested in, in uh, this form factor. And thanks so much, uh, Render, for sending us this machine to test out.